Helen's really sort of starting with the questions of, you know, what, what is it that we're talking about here? Why live stream? Why capture? So I'm going to hand you over to Helen now. My background is working across broadcast, digital, culture and arts sectors. And I've worked as both a commissioner, a producer, a creator and across radio, TV and online. As Linda says, I'm currently a freelance associate with the space, um, but I've spent the last four years setting up and managing their capture strand, which has helped organisations across the UK to film their work, learn new digital skills and also to reach, help them to reach online audiences. You can see some pictures of some of the productions that we've worked on. Welcome to this session. I'm going to give you some insights into the opportunities that capturing and streaming your work can offer you and your organisation. I'll be sharing some tips for success, some case studies, and also giving plenty of time for Q&A. To kick off and to avoid any confusion, I'm going to start off by defining what I mean when I say the word capture. Capture does just mean filming. Um, it's just that capture is used specifically to refer to the filming or capture of an existing or slightly modified work, rather than, for example, it being a scripted drama film. So it applies to work that, um, in the first instance, are created to be performed live rather than being created specifically for camera. So we could just say film, but given it's a genre in itself, ha uh, that using the word capture helps to differentiate it from, for example, scripted drama. So a live stream, Obviously, it's as simple, it can be as simple as this. Somebody like me is talking to the camera on my computer and it's streaming out via Zoom. But it can be much more complex. You might have a whole cast and crew, a multi camera capture um, uh, using multiple cameras. Um, it can be live or it can be pre recorded. Pre recorded is pretty self evident, it's, it's, it's recorded prior to the event. And it might be live or as live, which of course just means being recorded in advance and released relatively soon afterwards, uh, only slightly modified. It could be released at a later date, in which case, you know, for example, often you capture it on multiple cameras, you take it into the edit, you might uh, edit all the different camera angles together, you might want to put a, a title page on and credits and offer it on demand to, at, to the audience at a date that suits you and both them um, so that they can watch it at a time that's convenient for them. One of the questions we've had a lot about today is what are the advantages of, on, uh, of live versus on demand and we will be touching on that in the Q&A. But first of all let's just take a quick look at why stream or capture your work. Um, currently, it's the pandemic that's stopping audiences attend live events. But under normal circumstances, it might be factors like geography, family commitments or disability. And sharing your work digitally is just a great way of reaching diverse audiences, whether that's locally, nationally or internationally. And it has the bonus of helping to build the brand of your company and work, so your brand equity or reputational and creative worth. So whether your focus today is to learn how to gain an edge whilst creating content under the current lockdown, or if you're interested in learning good practice for when you'll have access to kit and crew, there are some universal considerations to make when capturing and streaming your work. Small, medium, or large budget, whether you're filming from home or location, size really doesn't determine success in the digital sphere. It's all about finding an approach that's right for you. Um, so let's look at some examples working left of screen round. Uh, you might have seen Jay Flynn's virtual pub quiz. It launched six weeks ago. He's a car salesman from Lancashire, and he launched his quiz from the front room of his house on the first night alone, there was 300,000 viewers from around the globe. Um, and I think it's really interesting because in week one, he pretty much broke all the rules that I'm going to go through today. So it is worth recognising that context is all. But I am really, and, and, and it hasn't affected his popularity. He goes from strength to strength. He's got loads of kind of celebrity endorsements. He's running more than two quizzes a week now. But he has, I noticed, from uh, his first stream in week one lost the kind of scarf ears he inadvertently gave himself by it because of the position of his camera uh, on the computer 
Uh, and when it comes to um, framing, uh, it, it is important to think about the, the, the experience for people who are watching at home whilst we're, we're streaming from our front rooms or our offices or whatever. And, and a really good example of how this has been done well, I think, is Tamara Rocker, who's the artistic director of the English National Ballet. And she's running really popular daily dance classes from her kitchen. But she's really thought about the shots. So she's moved the furniture aside and you've got a big, nice, wide shot. So if you want to follow her arms and legs, they're not falling out of frame. You can really see what she's doing and follow along. And she has the added advantage that she's got the musical composer of the English National Ballet's orchestra to compose music. So there's things to dance to without, um, of course, running into rights issues. And the third image is kind of ubiquitous for our times. It's the, it's the creative collaboration, this time on Zoom. Andrew Lloyd Webber got together with his Phantom of the Opera Orchestra really early on. He was a really early adopter. And it's really interesting to see what he's done. Every week, he's, he's kind of going from strength to strength, just really exploring the kind of digital capacity he has. So some weeks he'll play the piano and his daughter Isabella will be filming him. Then an, another day, he might just ask his fans to load stuff up on his Facebook page of them performing. So really, really interesting dialogue that he's established. And I think, although we are restricted in a lot of ways digitally, it's, there's still really interesting opportunities to take advantage of and I think particularly with Zoom I'm fascinated for example I saw Matt Lucas and David Williams exploring the split screen format to comedic effect on uh, the BBC's Big Night In and this kind of I don't know if you know but at the back end there's all kind of polls and chat rooms and I'm really interested to see one when theatre companies and arts organisations start to actually utilise these more and more as we get more confident and more used to our current circumstances. And certainly one of the most ambitious um, projects I've seen launched this week on ITV, Isolation Stories. Um, I don't know if you saw Sheridan Smith on Monday night playing a brilliant, I thought it was really, really great, um, telling her a drama story that she'd shot. Basically, uh, each actor was sent some very basic camera kit. Their husbands and wives and partners were roped in to be the camera operators and they filmed themselves and they sent the footage back to the editor and it was basically the nation is now watching a 15 minute four series um, mini series um, that was shot without anyone pretty much going outside or indeed ever meeting in real life. Um, going to go on to the next one. Let's just think about life beyond lockdown or pre-lockdown. These two images were taken. The first one was taken um, on location and it shows you a pretty, a pretty standard setup for a relatively low cost on, on location camera cap, multi-camera capture. This particular one was shot at a community centre in the Outer Hebrides. National Theatre Scotland were performing the, their play in the hall while their capture team set up in the tuck shop. Um, all the kit was brought in and built in situ. And you can see from the window, uh, we've just kind of taped up some black tape, a very DIY solution to block out the lights so that we could actually see the screens. We're wearing uh, lots of scarves and coats and gloves because it was so cold. There was no internet connection, so we used four cameras to record. And then we took the footage back to Glasgow to edit. The other image is much more um, a typical broad, the inside of a typical broadcast truck. Uh, it's often used in more high cost captures. You might have seen them outside gigs and sporting events with satellite trucks nearby. And this can be a really good solution depending on your budget or the scale of the project. And also in terms of the space available in the venue and the space available outside and whether there's capacity to build kit inside or park a large vehicle outside. Ultimately, all the options that I've talked about have the base, same basic functionality which is to enable you to share your work and engage with a digital audience. And if you'd like some great examples of captures, the Culture to Your Couch series is on the SPACE website and all the resources, which I'll mention quite a few during this morning's session, um, they are, will all be sent to you afterwards. Um, but let's just think about during lockdown. If you're planning on capturing or streaming your work, 
um, or more generally, you want to film but you have no or very low budget, there are some basic tips that you can adopt to make your productions look more professional. And what I would say is, first of all, ask yourself, where are you? Then ask yourself, where's your device? And then where is the light source? So first of all, where are you? In, in the frame, imagine it is divided into three both ways. So you've got nine grids. If your centre frame, where's your head? Give yourself a little bit of headroom. And I always think like the two finger rule is quite useful. Uh, try and give yourself enough room above. Um, if you're talking to somebody off frame to the left, for example, you might want to sit over here and, and make sure you uh, di direct eye line across this frame rather than, for example, setting up a shot where somebody's looking here for all the information in the shot is behind them. Device wise, think about your eye line. If, if it's not naturally in the frame, then you know, use good old uh, a breadboard or a book to try to build your laptop up so that it's height. We've seen far too many shots like this up your nose or, or kind of falling out of frame. I saw Benedict Cumberbatch on National Theatre uh, this week talking about Frankenstein and he was here. And I'm like, Benedict, we love you. Please let us see you full frame. Also, the other thing to remember is think of your room as a set. So people often say have something interesting behind you. And it makes me laugh because they kind of have something really close to their head. Like a picture, I saw somebody with a picture of the Sydney Opera House. I don't really think that's what people mean when they say something interesting. It's about the depth of field. You can't always, but actually the more depth you have between you and the objects behind, the better. Um, and then in terms of where is the light source, I'm just gonna show you a quick thing. If I turn my computer around now, you can see that the computer really doesn't like it and I'm in shade. So try to have a light source kind of 45 degrees, um, at a 45 degree angle. In terms of if you've really got no money and you're either filming currently or maybe things will get released a little bit and we can go out into the world. I have bought myself in the past and this is about four or five years ago when I bought this kit, uh, a little kind of mobile kit. So we've all got phones. Um, I have this little clip here, which hopefully you can see. It's just like this. So it helps me to attach my phone, which is my filming device. I have a tiny, tiny tripod, which can kind of wrap around things if need be. Or if I'm going out on location, I have a slightly bigger version, but you can see it, it basically fits into a tote bag. So it's very, very portable. I have a, a little microphone that I can clip onto a guest if I'm talking to them. And I also have this, which is a light. Um, and if I'm going out onto location, again, I have a little tripod. All this kit uh, four years ago cost me around a hundred quid. It was just off eBay. Um, my latest purchase is this, which is what YouTube stars um, use and this is called a ring light and that was 30 quid so um again you can see it's just lifting my face a little bit um so i've, I've given you my top tips for streaming at home i'm just going to bring in my colleague magnus who is really hot and passionate on sound and we'll give you some of his top tips in that area and then we'll move on to ask answer some questions thanks yeah i mean i i think what you're saying is so Exactly right. And it's obviously the image is super important. Um, there's no doubt. And you should definitely follow all that advice. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, but I am pretty obsessed with sound. I just think if you only sorted out your image and you had a brilliant image and your sound is slightly muffled, it's, it's just all wasted. I mean, number one for me is get, get as good sound as you can. These days, microphones are so good on um, phones and laptops. Uh, cameras are great as well. So you can get brilliant sound and picture from those devices if you're under, um, you know, a, 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 in a good situation. So like Helen's sitting right in front of her computer. I don't know what kind of mic she has now but uh, a laptop would pick you up brilliantly. But the moment that you're doing something slightly unusual, maybe you're doing a one man show, one person show and you're like moving around a little bit further away, 
that sounds going to be awful straight away. It doesn't take a lot of distance away from the mic. So, you know, really focus on that. If you can get yourself a wireless setup somehow, it is expensive, but there's so much kit available now and it's new things are coming on the market all the time and they're getting cheaper and cheaper. A wireless microphone, you, you'll, you'll find so many uses for that. And they're brilliant. If you don't have a wireless microphone, a lapel mic, like Helen was saying, it's what I'm wearing now. Um, if you're in a noisy environment, again, a laptop or a phone mic is going to start to struggle. Lapel mic is great to cut through that background noise and, uh, and really lift, yeah, lift your audio. If you've got more than one people talking, then it's a whole other thing, but maybe we'll deal with that more later. Just, uh, I'm interested in it. While, you, while the two of you are speaking, people are saying on the chat, you know, can you recommend where you go to buy stuff? And um, I'm wondering whether you two might have uh, a thought on that, but I was going to invite that all of the audience, <laughs> you know, yes. if you've bought any kit that you thought was fab, why not just put it into chat? I think that would be really helpful for everybody because it's, it's almost impossible to say this one thing is perfect, I guess. Unless there is, there's, there's, there's so many, yeah, there's so piece many piece great piece. bits of kit and they're all coming, new things coming on the market all the time. I think it's a great idea because you know, there's not like one obvious kind of radio mic that you should buy. I know what mic I have, um, but there's probably some new Chinese made, you know, radio mic that's like quarter the price and works just as well out there. Um, what would be your, what would be your advice to somebody who was starting to look for it? Is there a place you'd go to look or what, what would, you, Helen's nodding, what would you do, Helen? Well, I think like this ring light that I bought, um, I literally just Googled because I thought, who's going to know? What do YouTube stars use? And I looked and I, I kind of went through all the reviews. Some were better than others. And then I got the one I wanted. And I think what Magnus has said, said is really right, is that we could give you advice. But honestly, the kit I've just shown you is probably, well, it's already four years old. And I wouldn't go and buy necessarily this myself now. I mean, there are obviously some brands like Sennheiser um, who we know are good i don't have rights in joby grips but i'm very very impressed with this um to be honest this little clip that attaches to my phone was only a fiver anyway um whether it's a trademark of joby or anyone else i can't believe that there's going to be much in it in terms of the ring light when i bought that it actually came with this um to as a mobile phone holder so i think in some ways without wanting to spend too much money it's almost like jump in and just try. Um, as somebody who usually works with technical crew, I also think it's about asking their advice um, before getting a camera and getting it becoming really complex. You know, I know what my expertise is and suddenly becoming a camera woman probably isn't it, but I'm certainly happy to, fill, to um, buy this kit to help me film on a phone, which is pretty much point and shoot. I, just to add one little thing to that, I think um, it's true that getting, doing research and finding out a little bit about the kit that you're, you're looking at, so reading reviews, finding out what other people are using. Um, if, you, if you use a, a platform like Amazon, you, you don't have to buy it from Amazon, um, but it's good because it shows you real reviews, um, and then you may want to get it from eBay. There are things out there which don't work very well, um, it is a bit of a minefield um, and sometimes the cheapest things aren't, you know, aren't worth it and you, you do need to spend a little bit more money. So research, research, research before you do uh, buy stuff, I definitely recommend it. Well, we've got loads of recommendations on the chat. I don't know if you two will get a chance to see it, but it's all coming in thick and fast, which is great. Um, just one other question before we move back to you, Helen, which was um, one of the questions we were asked in advance was if you were filming with, you know, you're talking about some of the sort of principles and top tips, People filming with just one iPhone, what, can they, what could you do? What would you be your sort of creative view on making that really interesting? Well, it's interesting because I have tried this on projects and I've tried to be all fancy and do kind of cutaways and close-ups and different styles of shots. Could you just explain what cutaway is? So, for example, if I'm uh, talking to camera, but there's some activity behind me. I might, uh, you know, somebody walking a horse, don't know quite why that image has come to my head, but I might want to get a shot of that if the person is talking about it so it relates back. The kind of thing you see on standard TV. I have to say, what I realized is for low cost, simple social streaming, it didn't work for me because what you instantly do, you make it complicated and you need to cover the cop 
cuts. So you're suddenly going from a big shot to a little shot with external content in and you want music all of a sudden and then of course you enter the wonderful world of music clearance so actually what i did is i i the the time that's been most successful for me was when i did it very simply and i did a piece to camera and just allow people to talk to frame but kind of rehearse them in advance so i do think for for somebody that's not an experienced camera person like myself but a but a director so i know what a good frame looks like i say just keep it as simple as possible i don't know whether you agree with that magnus because you are a cameraman it's kind of what i was going to say if somebody was wanting to do something really um with a, a really simple set of kit i would i would kind of devil's advocate throw the question back and say don't you know interesting is probably not the not the first word i would use i would recommend try put everything you can into getting it technically uh, as good as you can so so take your time getting the framing right the lighting right sound right if you can just do something super simple like somebody just talking into frame but they can hear you brilliantly it's well lit there's you know nice things in the background that's what i think that's what people want more than a fancy a fancy edit or a fancy um stream okay so um just to, to after Magnus has spoken, he's going to do a bit more in getting into the kind of the technical nuts and bolts of uh, live streaming and there'll be more time for questions afterwards. I haven't explained this bit. We have lots of little short bits of questions. And then at the end of the session, when Magnus has finished his talk, the rest of the time will be for questions. So there's lots of opportunities. So we're not covering everything now. I just I wanted to go back to Helen, if you'd like to carry on, really, Helen, with thinking about, you know, you're going to introduce some case studies and so on, weren't you? Yeah, so whether you're thinking of capturing your work during or post uh, lockdown, there are certain key questions to ask yourself editorially to ma maximise your chance of success. Firstly, what's your story? Who are your audience and where are they already hanging out online? And who are your publishing and distribution partners? And importantly, do you have the rights and clearances that you need to tell the story that you want on the platforms that you've chosen? So in terms of story, what I would ask you is to ask yourself, there is so much content online. What is going to make your story compelling? Why is it relevant to tell now? For example, uh, does the work celebrate a key anniversary or does it have specific talent attached? What is the unique selling point? And then in terms of audience, if you haven't already, I think the current climate is a really good time to do a social media audit. Um, so which channels do you have and which channels actually attract a significant engaged audience um, who are commenting and sharing and clicking on your posts? For example, you might have Twitter or Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, but unless you have the capacity to update the social channels that you have with relevant content, I would suggest it might be better to focus on building traffic on one or two platforms and really focusing on posting um, content that will grow and engage your audience so that for ex after all there's no point in capturing or streaming your work if you don't already have a digital audience um, if in terms of bringing on publication uh, partners and distributors a top tip is um, when you're planning your social media strategy is to be both logical and lateral so one theater that I worked with called hundreds of schools and theaters that they'd uh, worked with in the past and asked them to cross post their capture. 50% uh, said yes. Um, so they got new, new the, the audiences of their partners. Their partners got great social content. So it was win-win. Another contacted their local premier football club to ask them to post short form content uh, that they'd made about a football show that they were doing. And a third great example was a dance company who'd choreographed a show uh, that was set in a war zone. And they got the they persuaded the British Army to live stream it on their Facebook page. So as well as reaching out to other arts organisations, don't forget that depending on the subject matter, your content may well appeal to non-traditional arts audiences um, and there is a, a resource on appealing to non-arts organizations that will be sent to you of course you must have the rights that you need for the platforms that you want to distribute on and as linda said this is a whole webinar in itself the space are going to be running some um 
webinars coming up and they'll also send you re some resources. But broadly speaking, it's more straightforward to clear rights for non-commercial than commercial use. So, story, audience, distribution and partnerships. To demonstrate my point, let's take a look at the first case study. This was a work um, that the space supported by um, Dance Consortium and they're a group of 20 large scale theatres who work together to bring top quality contemporary dance groups for, from around the world. But of course, it's expensive to bring companies to the UK and tour them and the consortium wanted to look at longer term cost effective options for virtual touring. And initially they looked at options like the Royal Opera House model or the National Theatre option, but they realised that this was very expensive and time consuming in terms of clearing the rights that they'd need. So together we worked on a solution. The Alvin Ailey American Dance Theatre were coming to the UK for a very, sh for, I think it was for one week, and they were going to be uh, dance, uh, uh, dancing on, at Sadler's Wells. So Dance Consortium persuaded them to um, do a live masterclass from the stage that would stream to some of their venues across the UK and also on social media so that people could join in and dance from the comfort of their own homes. It was a huge success. Story-wise, in this case, the story was a masterclass and also it had a Q&A session. So Dance Consortium actually brought in a presenter to feed the questions direct from the online audience to the live dancers so that it felt like they were properly engaged. It was particularly relevant. It was, there was the 20th anniversary of the consortium. Um, it was a first for both parties um, and it offered direct access to a world-renowned company. So helping it become a really must-have must attend live event. In terms of audience, there was two um, priorities for Dance Consortium. The first was they really wanted to engage their existing audience by offering them a once in a lifetime event to work with this legendary company. But longer term, the Dance Consortium have got um, an ambition to build a more diverse, younger audience. And of course, by partnering with somebody with, uh, like Alvin Ailey, um, they we, who already have a following in amongst uh, a more diverse demographic, they instantly got access to that audience. So in terms of partnerships, it couldn't be better. It was the first for both parties. And whilst we've been in lockdown, I've seen online that both companies have been doing masterclasses. Um, if you do want to see the masterclass, by the way, that, that's another link that you can uh, access. Um, so it was really successful. In terms of the second case study, uh, this features a work called Bobble by Theatre and Cut. It was released uh, at the end of March. And it's another really great example of how plays can be performed and created and shared without the cast and crew ever meeting. It depicts a social media conversation between students and professor and what goes wrong when some of the comments are misconstrued and there's fallout. Um, the theatre company worked with three UK universities and three European universities and the students, uh, actors, performed all the roles. So they were rehearsed over Skype, they filmed themselves on their smartphones, then they sent the footage to an editor who cut it and then streamed it as live, a 45 minute performance. Story-wise, the story-wise is really relevant. Um, freedom of speech on campuses is very part of the zeitgeist. It was written by an award-winning playwright, Kieran Hurley, and it really adopted a creative and collaborative approach using things like emojis and text speak. So it was a really novel way of digital storytelling, enabling it to get traction and attract publicity for that reason. In terms of audience, they specifically targeted international audience and particularly students. Obviously, they already had the six universities involved and then they, um, the company actually has a reputation for commissioning work, but then also releasing it so that people can actually perform their work. And they did this in this case, so the audiences not only got a chance to watch uh, the material that was already shot, but they were invited to film and share their versions of the production. So Theatre and Cut, in terms of partners, had got the six universities, then they also worked with National Union of Students, um, and it's been really successful. So, so far, over 55,000 uh, people have watched the production, and the actual play that they can be performed by other people has been downloaded by people in 21 countries. Um, 
So I would really advise to, to keep revisiting these those three factors, story audience distribution uh, partners throughout the three stages of production. And of course they are pre-production, production and post-production. And it, they broadly correspond to plan, make, review and share. And I cannot recommend enough that the more you do in the pre-production stage, the better for you. So things like uh, clearing in principle rights, finding a crew and a venue and penciling it, as in saying, we want to do it, please hold this for us. Scheduling both your production and your post-production and distribution. The more you can do in stage one, the more chance you have of delivering to time and budget. I have created a one page capture checklist which will be sent to you so that it'll just give you something to run down and hopefully help you um, not, not miss any of the crucial things off. Uh, live, Because live streaming and capturing, it's all about collaboration between your team and the filming team. And the sooner that you can start to work together, the better. So my top tips if you are planning a multi-camera capture is ask the experts. You really don't need to be an expert in broadcasting. The trick is to find the right capture team who can help you to ask the right questions. Because inevitably, capturing your work will involve a level of compromise to your event or live show. And it's crucial that your artistic director and your creative team feel comfortable with the capture director and their team, and that you feel that they're sharing your company's vis uh, vision. You have to acknowledge screen grammar because just pointing at a camera at the action when it's a big play means nothing. The camera's got to have perspective and shots make, must make sense of the production. One of the first things a capture director will typically ask you for is a scratch tape. And that's just a basic recording of your production um, so that they can see the setup and the stage direction. And from here, they would create a shooting script to work out the choreography of the shots with the cameras that they have available. Um, the cameras and the shots obviously add to the storytelling and then they can guide the online audience and enhance the stage direction for screen. Mm -hmm. And fourthly, if you can, build in a camera rehearsal. Um, it gives team members from both sides, the creative side and the camera side, a chance to watch the performance back and see whether any tweaks need to be made to lighting, to the set, to the costume. Um, if you can uh, record this rehearsal, even better, so that if your master recording goes down for whatever reason, you've got a safety copy. Um, so we've kind of quickly run through top tips for editorial and production process and now we're going to ask some questions, uh, uh, sorry, answer some questions, but also Magnus is going to expand on some of the production and technical skills. Thanks Helen. Just um, before I'm going to invite people to ask questions via the Q&A function, but while you're doing that, you know, your top tips are really brilliant. And we've had lots of questions in advance for people sort of saying, well, how do we ensure a really good audience experience for an online audience who might be used to, you know, coming into a theatre or going to a gallery? What if you at the moment you don't have access to crew and all the resources you might have at other times? What how would you sort of translate your top tips to that a different the different situation of now? I think. Filming during lockdown is obviously very different and I think it's about trying things but not trying too many things. What typically appeals to the existing audience and how might you continue that? So are you going to pl plan, for example, a short series of events? Because just releasing content with kind of no context is not worth it. You've got to establish trust with your audience so that they understand what to expect and it's not just a one-off unless, of course, you've deliberately built it to be a one-off. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, and somebody's asking for, for a bit of clarity, what do you mean by screen grammar? Ah, yes, well, thank you, yes. Um, so I suppose it's things like uh, when you watch a film, you, you, in, in, you absolutely know what screen grammar is, whether you know that that's the terminology, is that if there's a wide shot in a room and suddenly you go into a close-up of somebody's eyes, 
you're being told it's a storytelling device you're being told what's important is that close-up whatever's happening in that image so the eyes so you're really kind of usually you know it might be an emotion that you're being asked to experience so if you watch tv you're already experts at screen grammar whether or not you know what the word is okay thank you um, and I'd just like to go back a bit. So we had some questions earlier about um, sort of going back to the idea of sound and microphones. And I, can I, I'm, Magnus, I guess this one just comes to you first, which is um, somebody saying um, when teaching dance classes online, we noticed an issue trying to use computer sound simultaneously with a microphone as a laptop can't seem to have both at the same time. Helen's nodding. Have you got any suggestions on best setup for good quality sound? And they're talking about speaking, I think, while music's playing. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I know a little on bit. Zoom. He's talking specifically about Zoom, but it might, there might be wider implications for other people. Yeah, I know that my wife um, dances, so she's been doing some dance classes. Um, and I think what some people are doing is they're playing the music in the room out of speakers, like maybe the computer speakers, but they cut the sounds coming into their room. They have a mic, which is picking up their speaking, the teacher, and also the music. Now microphones are specifically, sorry, I shouldn't touch it, specifically designed to, to basically block out any noise that isn't the dialogue. So what you end up doing is, is only barely record uh, hearing the music properly and it kind of comes and goes and then if you're if, if it's up really loud then you probably just don't hear anything the key is to find a way to play the music through your system so for example on this zoom call right now i could play a video clip or play an audio clip and send the audio directly to the the viewers and they would receive it like it's not coming out of a speaker and then going into a microphone. It's going direct and it should come out of your computer where, wherever you are exactly the same as if you played it on your computer. And that, that's the way to do it. Um, so with Zoom, I think it's fairly simple. You would just um, like share, share that screen or share that video or share that music file. I think they still hear you talking, but th then the only other problem is for the teacher, they need to also hear it but they can maybe have it coming out of their speaker quite quietly. So they can hear it, but not, you know, it doesn't come into the microphone. I think that's, it's not always that easy to configure that. And um, some, some um, platforms are harder than others. So Facebook Live, I don't quite know how you would do that without some, some serious kind of kit. But, okay. um, but, but yeah, that's a general, general principle, I think. Okay, lovely. Um, and we've had another question about, um, I guess, to Helen, really, about somebody asking um, that, and it's come up again uh, in, previously, what sort of length, you know, what kind of length of pieces are audiences engaged by? And how do you keep them sustained? Well, I don't think necessarily it's the length of what they're sustained by, because I, you know, if it's a play that's a Shakespeare play, it's a certain length. I think what's crucial is to make the beginning really, really interesting. Like don't make them wait for something to be interesting. Don't be giving like long uh, uh, intros or, or if you're doing a podcast, you know, a rambling intro, cut straight to the action, let people know what's happening. And actually with captures particularly, like lots of our arts organizations have got archive shows that might have captured an hour and a half performance for example i think it's quite good to intro it with a presenter so that's like a two or three minute intro so the audiences know what's coming up or if you don't have that opportunity then put it in the um beneath the line on a social platform so i mean short form content is obviously good on social you know kind of 10 seconds you've got i think to engage people i think 30 seconds to a minute is obviously good but i don't think it's necessarily either or i think if you're going to do a capture clearly you need people to know where it's going to be and i think one of the exciting things about creating your own material is you can take stuff and actually edit it and make fantastic teasers so that you're building this sense of anticipation in advance and you're kind of launching it out onto the world saying come and join us come and share this water cooler moment which i think you know jay flynn's pub quiz is the perfect illustration of how much we still want shared experience under the current situation absolutely okay thank you um, i'm going to read the next question then because it's quite 
long and I think it's aimed back to you. It's, so can we consider how we persuade an audience using, they're used to experiencing live performance in a theatre to subscribe to an online streaming season of new productions when the theatre is closed? So this is quite a big question. Um, there seems to be a suggestion that you don't want to risk an online project without a guarantee of an existing audience. So I guess it's about how do you, what, what can you do to move your existing live audience into the online space? Uh, well, I'm presuming that if you're a theatre already, you will already have following. If you haven't, then I'll go into it briefly, but I advise logging onto the webinar about build, building online audiences. Um, I absolutely think, I think it's a great idea, and I've seen many, many theatre companies, I saw Headlong, in fact, Headlong Theatre Company said they were about to do some productions, and I think they've been picked up by the BBC, but certainly, absolutely, yes, get people to subscribe. I think the message, though, is you still have to go to where your audiences are online. I think the difficulty is, if you're asking them to go and register somewhere else, that's very difficult. But where is the audience that you already have for your theatre shows? So one, one example is your theatre social channels and or your fr friends of your company. Another thing is, is at the moment, celebrities are free. Uh, and when I say celebrities, I mean that at all different levels. You know, it might be that you have a, a kind of influencer or a supporter within your production. And I would also get people in the production to help you spread the word um, so that they're actually acting as your ambassadors. And, you know, for example, I did a project in Sunderland uh, for hard to reach communities. I got local celebrities and, you know, Joe McKeldry. He's from Sunderland. Uh, Chris Ramsey, he's from Sunderland. They both did stuff for free for me, just really to help ensure that the audience felt safe, that these were faces they knew, they they're not typically don't typically regard themselves as an arts audience. So that was my way of thinking, how am I going to persuade them? It's okay, you're okay with me. And I suppose that's it. Ultimately, it's all about establishing trust with your audience and making sure that you deliver what you say you're going to deliver. And it's true to the voice that you have in real life. You know, if you're a very serious uh, theatrical company, you don't want to suddenly start to broadcast something that's not relevant to the audience that you've already got. Okay, lovely. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yeah, and um, Claire's just pointing out that we've got an audience toolkit on... Um, really good. ...which we'll yeah. send, send a, a link to, and also... We're going to speak in, uh, they might have some other resources about platforms and what works for what audience we can point to. Um, and again, so this is a question to both of you that we, um, you, you know, we're speaking about um, live streaming and capture. And what, how does somebody make the decision about which way to go, whether to live stream or to capture and stream later on? What, what are the sort of pros and cons, the advantages? Helen, do you want to kick off and then we'll go to Magnus? I'll pick up. Let, let's see if we give the same answer. We might not. But um, <laughs> I, I think kind of it comes back to my story audiences platforms, which is, for example, if you're going to do a masterclass and Q&A, then the content, the story... Is, is absolutely perfect to be live streamed. You want to create an interactive experience for your audience. It would be mad to do it and then not be able to involve the, or the live audience. However, if you were doing a, uh, you know, say you had a cast of 10 on a stage or you had a, a really complex production, being able to offer it on demand might just give you the opportunity to uh, plan your shots you know if you're doing it on demand it gives you the opportunity to film it from various points of view and then go away to the edit and cut it so for example you might be able to put you know a gopro on your head and film it from the main character's perspective and then cut that in you can't really do that live so i think it very much depends on the content uh, and just one quick thing is four years ago when i first started setting up the capture strand for the space it was very much the rule that you always did it live if you could because you wanted to create a water cooler moment but that was before facebook live and i think I definitely think you need to create an event where you launch it into the world so that it's a real water cooler moment, but that doesn't actually require it being live anymore because software has changed and the platforms have changed and therefore Facebook Live 
is still live you're just mm. creating that moment okay thank you um, magnus what do do you have anything to add or challenge or not really i was hoping that you would say something i disagree with and then we could have a big meaty discussion yeah i basically i uh, completely agree with everything i think normally i've had so many conversations with people about this like somebody will say i want to live stream a show and you sit down and you talk through the specifics of that show and how and you just get to the end and it's like obvious that it's best to pre-record or you talk it through and you're like it's obvious that we should live stream this it usually decides itself based on the, sh the show you know there are factors that just make it so difficult to live stream or it's such a compromise that it's just silly to um, and then sometimes it's like the audience interaction that online like real time interaction is so brilliant that it would be silly not to live stream yeah okay um and just before we kind of get get you to carry on magnus we've, we've got lots of questions coming in about platforms and some one of them says is youtube the best platform for doing it yourself and i wonder if you have an opinion well I I mean, in ter I'm, not a, I'm not a social media expert in the, in the sense of um, what's best to get the biggest audience or the right audience, you know, to build an audience, for example. I, I suspect YouTube isn't the best way to do it. YouTube is, is the best platform for pure uh, tech. So if you want the best quality, you can, you, can, um, you can do 4K streams, HD, really high bit rate. You can make stuff look amazing on YouTube and it has lots of functionality. In terms of like actually getting most, like the biggest audience, YouTube is probably the least good one. Uh, Facebook and Twitter are usually what people go to first in order to get like pure numbers of viewers. Ooh. So um, yeah, it depends what, what, what they mean really in, in terms of best. I think Helen's got a comment as well and then we'll come back to you to carry on. Yeah, what I would say is it doesn't have to be either or. Uh, you can yeah. stream to them both at the same time. I mean, I would advise against, for example, streaming on YouTube and feeding it to Facebook. I think natively is much better. So you literally stream to YouTube and to Facebook because Facebook algorithms don't really favour feeds from other social channels. But ultimately, you can do three, four, five. Although saying that, of course, I wouldn't okay. I just and do my own. Okay. And again, that, it might be that people in our audience have got experience of using different platforms for their work. And perhaps this is a chance to share about, you know, and give other people some opinions about what either those big three platforms or any of the other smaller platforms. Um, and we've also had questions, which I think we'll go think about later on about sort of d donations and how, you know, w where might you go to try and um, br bring in some revenue from your work. So we'll there's come also to that Vimeo Live. No one ever talks about it. And it's extremely expensive unless it's changed recently. I've done it once Vimeo Live. And it's uh, it, I would say it's the best in terms of quality and functionality and there's loads of ways that you can uh, generate income from there as well but it's the least known um, and possibly the least kind of audience but just to just to add that in there Vimeo uh, live okay okay brilliant thank you so um, Magnus do you want to um, just do you want to kind of move on we've, we've sort of talked about the pros and cons of whether you're live streaming or capturing but is, let's assume now that somebody has made a decision that they want to live stream. What yeah. you, you're going to start really by thinking about some of the questions you ask you ask of people who come want to work with you to do live streaming. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, so assuming that you've chosen to live stream, we've had that conversation, and whatever it is that you're uh, doing is just perfectly suited for live stream. Um, my next question would be how how complex how big how fancy do you want your live stream to be um so i mean how many cameras do you want how many microphones um and that possibly means how much money do you do you want to put into it um it's you know d determined largely by that um the second thing i want to talk about is whether if this is some an event or workshop or show that you have done before whether it's right to just roll it out again exactly as you always have done or whether really we need to sit down and make some fundamental changes to how you deliver that work so that it works better for an online audience um, and then thirdly what happens once uh, the live event has happened finished 
is that it? Is that the end? Uh, or is there a further life that uh, the work can have? Okay, so let's get started. Now this kit, uh, this kit, this um, slide is super complex and I don't uh, really have time to kind of go into it in detail. You can probably download it if you uh, want to. Um, and it has some suggestions basically for different levels of kit. So in terms of how complex you want to make your uh, live stream. At the very top is the simplest way you can do it. As you all know, if you've got a laptop, you can just sit in your home office and stream yourself uh, with no kit at all, just your laptop or a phone. Um, and then going down this uh, flow chart, it gets gradually more and more complex as we add more kit, more capability, more complexity, and usually more cost. Um, and then at the bottom is, is what I do, uh, which is an external company will come in and kind of take care of everything for you, bring all the kits and, and do it. And there's, there's things that we can do, which possibly you wouldn't be able to do uh, on your own in a company, uh, unless you're, you know, you have serious amounts of money or, uh, you know, the, the, the kit, the, the, the technicians in there that can, that can do those things. Um, so we can, if you're interested in the specifics of this, um, pop some questions in and we'll talk um, more specifically later. Um, most of this is about audio because as I said, I am a bit obsessed with audio, um, but, um, but also multiple cameras, multiple platforms, streaming to multiple platforms, things like that, captioning, BSL, things like that um, are going to add. When you start adding complexity like that, it starts getting very difficult to do it yourself. Um, and on the complexity cost, I've got this wonderful graph. Here. Apologies for my super simple slides. I know they're awful. Um, but this, um, this graph is a universal law of diminishing returns. You can achieve quite a lot with very little money. Um, and I'm a big believer in trying to do things as cheaply as possible so that it's sustainable and you can do it again and again and again, rather than uh, trying to raise huge amounts of money for a one hit wonder and then you can never do that again. Um, so, you know, buying a bit of kit, small amount of kit to make your home streaming setup work. It's a great idea. You can achieve brilliant things. What I offer is this, the um, space would call it low cost capture as opposed to their high cost capture kind of strand. Um, you might not consider it low cost. So our streams are between five and 15 grand. And um, so you can call that mid range if you like. High cost, uh, you know, 100, 200, uh, you know, can be anything. Um, and sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll watch a stream that I've done for 10 grand and a stream that's, that's cost 200 grand. And on the surface, you might not really be able to tell that much difference. They both do the same job. And Helen was making that point brilliantly earlier. I don't know if she meant to make quite that point, but that um, ultimately all these are different ways of doing the same thing. And, and your show will be out there if you've got 10 grand or uh, 100 grand. Um, but there are things in the background there. Somebody might say, well, I really want live subtitling in Arabic, for example. Uh, and that's the kind of thing just costs so much money. If you need an OB truck because you don't have the space inside for the kit, or if you want 15 cameras uh, or 15 microphones, you're starting to get into the realms of, well, I'm, I'm going to struggle to do that with my kit. So I would be, you know, just possibly saying, you know what, I don't think the scale of your production is going to work at this budget level. So there are times where you just have to go up. But um, these are some examples of some of my shoots. You can see that the kind of scale, um, multiple cameras, I think there were three cameras. This is an artist talk, lights, microphones, uh, there's a ta tallies so that uh, the, the people talking can see which camera is live if they want to talk directly to the audience. Vision mixing. So this is uh, my partner Katya's vision mixing here, uh, multiple cameras. This is a stream where we had to have um, satellite internet because there was no, uh, no internet on the island. Um, here you can see briefly is a BSL interpreter box that's added in the corner of the image. These are kinds of things that, that, that we can do with the kit that we have. Um, now, I'm gonna talk a bit about um, platforms. I get asked about this a lot. Um, and just to define what I mean by aspect ratio, just in case anyone doesn't know, if uh, you have a phone, you hold it portrait or landscape, 
um, that aspect ratio. So portrait, um, nine by 16, landscape, 16 by nine. So right now we're streaming 16 by nine landscape, which is the usual kind of TV shape. And Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitter streams through Periscope. So it's essentially the same thing. You don't need to worry about that too much. These three platforms all stream landscape. And Instagram only streams portrait, which means that they're, they're kind of like different beasts entirely. And um, to stream to all three, at, uh, all four at once would be extremely difficult. You'd have to frame landscape and take a portrait crop or the other way around for Instagram. It's almost never going to work. Um, you could have double the cameras, uh, you know, some cameras frame portraits, some land. It's just, it just, the complexity is going to be ridiculous. So I've never, never actually done that before. Uh, however, you can stream to Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope all at the same time because they will accept the same stream. Now, you know, th this assuming that you've got the kit in order to stream to three platforms simultaneously, we can talk a, a bit more about how you can do that. There are, there are ways, even if you're just sitting there with your uh, laptop, it's possible. Um, it just has a little bit of complexity. Now, lastly, I just want to talk about the Premiere function, YouTube and Facebook has a, as an as live function, which is absolutely brilliant. So as Helen was talking about the different ways that you could, you could, you know, pre-record something, say a few days before it's as live and then upload it to uh, YouTube and Facebook, schedule that to start at a particular time. And then you've got all of the buzz of like going live um, with some, loads of advantages for example you can caption it in those few days proper exact captions that you can check you could do it in other languages you could add a bsl window if you wanted um, you can make it start exactly on the beginning of the program rather than when you actually when it's actually live you really need countdowns and you know uh, there's loads of complexity afterwards because you you're, you're stuck with a countdown timer and so it's a brilliant function, but obviously it's not actually live. So you don't have the audience interaction and people will know that it's not actually live uh, or they probably should. Um, if you pretended, you might get caught out, but um, all brilliant options. Um, now, my third point was about adapting your work. Now, let, let's just say that you always do artist talks uh, or workshops or you have a show um, you know, and we, we can sit down and talk about how to live stream it. Now, this is a difficult one. Should you make changes to your uh, event, workshop, show, um, whatever you're doing to make it work better for a live audience? Now, live audience is completely different from a room audience. Just consider firstly, just the, the pace and the time, you know, that how snappy you expect a broadcast on TV to be. You, you wouldn't wait for 60 seconds while a newsreader was fumbling trying to find their, their words. It just never ever happens. It's because you'd lose interest and switch the channel. So, you know, you have to just work on a totally different time scale. And there are, there are a bundle of uh, great suggestions I, I can give you now, um, but it's, it's totally up to you and it's individual to the type of event or workshop or project, whatever it is you're doing. Um, but this is a, a definitely a, a, a step that you should go through. And sometimes things do work as, as they always have online, but usually we have to make some changes. Now, this image here is essentially an artist talk uh, that we, uh, the space and myself streamed. This is Sonia Boyce, the artist, Tim Marlowe, the uh, presenter, and it's in Manchester Art Gallery. And you can find this uh, on the Manchester um, art gallery Facebook page and possibly the space and I'm sure we'll, we'll um, share it later so you can watch it in full. I'm not going to um, play it now because if you don't have a great uh, connection you're probably not going to be able to see it properly but I will show you some stills from it. Um, so straight away you can see that we have a presenter now, you might not necessarily think to have a presenter if you're doing an artist talk. You could just get the artist on camera, prepare a speech, deliver it. But it's a brilliant thing for live. It adds dynamism. It adds a pace and uh, it, it, it enables you to control the time. Um, a great thing to consider. Have, have a check out later. Watch it and see what you think. Um, it... Th th I, I would urge you to script your live stream if you wouldn't normally script it. And what I mean by that is um, it could just be as simple as script the opening links, 
you have a, a schedule of time that you're going to go through so that it's not completely organic and can just go massively wrong. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm talking about these points in, in just really superficially. These are huge things that we could possibly discuss more later. Um, Helen mentioned about rehearsals. Again, if you don't normally rehearse your talks, definitely if you can rehearse them because even the crew, the cameras, they, they will benefit so hugely from having seen everything happen before. And if you've got a script and you've got tight timings, um, it, it will help you hit those timings so much easily if you've rehearsed. Um, we've got an audience here. Now, you probably aren't going to be able to have an audience in your live streams for, for ages, but you may well be able to have a, a talk in a room with maybe a presenter. Um, I, I'm imagining it's going to be possible fairly soon if you follow the rules like this. Those, those uh, two are possibly far enough apart. But uh, if you do have an audience, we're talking super future here, are they a real ticketed audience that are perhaps going to go to the toilet in the middle and arrive late? Or do you want to control those people, invite them, and basically, and then they do what they're told. Um, and just accessibility, just one thing I want to talk about. Um, it's very hard for, um, for doing uh, live captioning, although it's been done now brilliantly. And I think the tech is changing all the time. The platforms are um, adding functionality all the time for this. So there's, there, there are ways to live caption your work. Um, and the, I showed you the BSL, live BSL we did. There are ways, they're very difficult, probably quite expensive. And I've, I've done live captioning before and it, it's been a total disaster because they're just not accurate enough. Um, I'll be, I should be watching my own subtitles to see if she's keeping up with my super quick speech. I imagine it's a nightmare. Um, whereas if it's pre-recorded, then you can caption it and, and that solves that problem. But anyway, I'm going back to... Um, whether you should or shouldn't live stream. And these are essentially the points I was just making. And um, all the slides will be available for download. So if, if you didn't catch anything, you can download that. And we can talk about it more uh, in the questions if any of those particular things are, are of interest. And I would recommend just having checking out that uh, video to see whether you agree with you know, how we did it. Linda, are you wanting to? Well, just um, uh, so, so we, we're talking about live streaming at an artist talk and yeah. there's been questions coming in about a couple of other scenarios and I wondered if you would have the same considerations and one of them was about um, in a situation where you might be wanting to incorporate some uh, live action and existing material is yeah, that, so, so you we, know, for example, a festival or something. Yes, yeah, so, so we, we do that, we call it VT. So actually even this talk, although we've kind of hidden it, I'll flick through and I'll show you an example. That is actually a pre-recorded insert and it's a moving, you know, um, shot of the, of the painting. We've got various like really fine details. So we had a bank of clips ready and we were listening to what was being said. And if something was referenced, we would cut it in. And I believe there were other... Uh, if I just flick through, you might have to move more slowly, Mar uh, Magnus, in case people have got. Uh, yeah, I just I will find I'll find the moment and then I'll stop because we were cutting yeah. cutting in um, Sonia's other work. If she mentioned, yeah, here we go. So, so she's mentioning uh, work that she's done. Obviously, that's not in the room. We had that as a bank of possible cut-ins. Now I've done this recently, and we did it better than this because it, it was uh, moving and animated adds another level of complexity but absolutely it's, it's all about kit it's like what I was talking about complexity um, we can do that we might need to bring in another computer that basically does the VTs and you might even need another person listening to what's been said selecting the correct um, image or clip and playing it at the right time or if it's all scheduled and all planned then uh, perhaps it's not such a big deal because you just you should build it into your script Helen, were you? Uh, you're muted. Helen, you're muted. Unmute. Unmute. Sorry about that. All I was going to say is I totally agree. And actually, you can of course do it not just with stills, but also video content that you've shot in advance. So, Linda, you suggested festival, and that worked a great effect with London 1666. Artichoke, the company that does lots of big uh, outdoor events, did a live stream from 
the Thames where they worked with David Best, the burn artist. And there was lots and lots of pre-recorded material that was placed within the live context. So um, it's like a running order where you literally, this is live, this is not live, this is yep. live. And, and for some live streams, uh, we've had like a, a monitor in the room and, uh, and the presenter has an earpiece and you actually have to, you know, the presenter needs to know that you've cut to VT and then they watch the VT and they know that you get a countdown, you know, back where you, they're live again. And, and it works brilliantly because then they've just watched it, they can reference it, they can comment on it and they know exactly when it's finished and they're ready to carry on. It works brilliantly, but again, a whole other level of complexity when you start going there, but definitely worth, worth doing. Thank you. Um, so you, you, you've spoken really about, um, you know, give us an example of how this works, some of the considerations. Do you want to move on to your next point? Uh, uh, yes, but afterwards, what happens later, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so obviously, it, that's not it. You know, once it's gone out live, that's not the end. Most of the streams that I've worked on seem to get the same, if not more, views after the fact. So they've gone out live, and then actually they, loads of people watch it once it's finished, it still kind of retains that buzz of like you were live. And, and so, so it can stay on there for a week or forever, if you like. Um, also, we always record um, everything we do. And so you can edit it, refine it, change it, improve it, fix things that maybe went wrong, and then upload that again. So, so what some people do is they maybe let, let the live version be on there for a certain amount of time. Um, then they might take it down or they might leave it and they might up upload a, a more polished kind of refined version um, and that you might get a whole other load of views then at that point. You can take short clips from your work and they will work as standalone little kind of social media clips that you can post. And a couple of streams I've done recently, they've planned to continue filming beyond the end. So we've got like 60 minutes of live content it's ended and then they're like, right, okay, we're going to do another 30 minutes of talk or Q and a record it. And then maybe six months down the line, they can release that as new content. We're all there in the room. We're all paid for. It doesn't actually really cost any more money. Um, but you've essentially made a whole other film. So loads of things you can do after the fact, Helen's probably got a whole load more she can add to that. Okay. Do, um, Helen, did you oh, want to add anything to captions. that? Captions. I forgot captions you can add as well. Helen, oh, yeah. you could put that in if you wanted. I was just going to say, I, I forgot to mention, that's a, that's a biggie. Like if you, if you live stream without any uh, captions, without any kind of accessibility, and you say to people like, we're going to upload it, you know, in a few days with captions, so don't worry, just come back then. It's, it's very easy to, to get the content that you film, send it to a company like rev.com. There are other people and, as well that do it, and they will caption it for you. And then you can upload it again. Or you can upload the captions to the existing stream and add them in you know, a day or so later. So, and then you get a whole new audience then who, who weren't able to watch it live because of that, but now they can. Okay. And um, if anybody wants to see live captioning happening, just if you go down to the closed caption option, you can watch what Claire's doing at the moment to see whether that would be a, a kind of service that would, would work if we're during the event rather than afterwards. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you both a question? So, you know, what we're talking about is a lot about the, the capturing the filming of, of, of the event. And then you've also been speaking about when it goes out there and what happens afterwards. But is there a kind of magic bit in between those two stages that we need to know about? How, how you get from the capture to the audience? Yeah, well, I, I, I guess what you mean is the, is, is the let me take my uh, slide off. It's a third party encoder. So what that means is if you, if you just get your phone out and live stream yourself from your phone, then the, the Facebook web page is doing the encoding. So it's just, you don't even know it's happening. It just goes. If you uh, want to do super complicated stuff, then you really need to uh, use a third party encoder. All that means is that your computer isn't running Facebook, it's running a software package, which takes the video in and the audio, encodes it and sends it to Facebook. Facebook then receives it and streams it. And it sounds like a pointless step, but the software that you're using there enables you to do endless things. So for example, if you wanted to do multicam, 
you can multicam in, in a bit of software there on your, on your laptop, have two cameras going in, multicam, and send the edited version of that. And there are, there are endless additional things you can do with a, a third-party encoder, um, which I won't bore you with now. But that, that I suppose, is, is the magic step. Um, okay. okay. And Helen's got something to add. Yeah, that's the magic step with a live stream. If it's on demand, I would say one of the magic steps is all in the edit. And actually the edit is so crucial if you're shooting on demand because this is the place where you can hone all your shots. You can, if you've got five cameras, this is where you knit those camera angles together and you might add the music. You might want to color grade stuff. So for example, five cameras are probably the the actual colour on the film is probably all slightly different. So you might tweak it. So it's all those kind of things as well. Maybe put music on, look at the audio. So I would say the real magic often happens in the edit. Mm. And, and how, how much editing could it, you know, if we're talking about somebody in, in lockdown, how much editing can a person do successfully without, if they're not an expert already, you know, experienced editor? Well, I admit that I only use Mac computers, so um, I, I only know about iMovie and Final Cut. I think iMovie is really, really intuitive, and it comes as kind of free as part of your laptop. I think you can do good visual stuff, and again, back to what Magnus said earlier, the sound and what you can achieve sound-wise is more complex. Mm. Okay. But 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 um, depending if you've got a minimal budget, obviously there are lots of editors in lockdown and it's actually possibly a chance for people to send footage across the internet and then get them to edit it and send it back. I mean, I think if I was doing something really complicated, I'd do that. I mean, I've actually taught myself to use Final Cut and I kind of tend to think if I can do it, anyone can. But... Um, learning anything in lockdown is kind of a challenge as well isn't it you have all the time in the world but whether we necessarily have the brain power is different to know at the moment yeah okay thank you um and the, sorry magnus just going back to you again this so the, obviously the question that you were talking about third party uh, a third party encoder is there something you'd recommend to people um i use um wirecast which is quite an expensive package, um, mm. but it's very, very powerful. And you can, you can use that to multicam, put uh, captions on. You, you have a timeline and you can edit. You can do all kinds of really, really complicated things. You can share your screen as well. Um, it is a brilliant package, but it is expensive. That will do it. There, are, there is a, ch a free package. Oh, what's it called? O OBS? OSB. I don't use it, so I know of it, but I don't actually use it. OBS, I think, which is this, okay. it's just the same thing. I'll see if I can find it because I do actually have it on my. Oh, well, okay. somebody will probably say in the OBS. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is free and essentially does the same thing. I don't think it's quite as powerful, but um, it is free, and and you and you can, um, I think, do quite quite a bit with it. So um, it's it's much kind of simpler. You know, it looks simpler, and it's possibly easier to use. Okay, and Helen? Well, one thing actually, I'm just flipping the back a little bit. Somebody asked a really good question about um, using mixed media, so using both footage shot before whilst online. Something that I learned the other day, which is just while it's in my head, I don't know if you've experienced this, Magnus, but when using Zoom, if you have an MP4 on your desktop, you can screen share, but if you have a link, for example, from YouTube, yeah it's not as reliable and I, I have had it work, but I've also had it not working. So my advice is if you are doing a performance and you want to share things, it's much better to have the data on your desktop. Sorry, it was just occurred to me after we'd answered that question. Okay. Well, it's the, the, the clip that you actually see on your screen um, is whatever YouTube decides to stream to you. And if you're, uh, using quite a lot of your internet connection to do your actual zoom call it might decide to send you a really low quality video um, it changes depending on the bandwidth and then it's very compressed and then what you're doing is compressing it again um, or you're encoding it again and they're decompressing it at the other end so every stage of compression 
you're going to uh, lose quality. And so very quickly, it's going to look awful and sound awful. If you download it, if you can download it, if it's your film, you get it in a really original best quality, then you're reducing those encoding steps and you're going to get much better quality. So similar to what I was saying about the microphone, playing it out of a speaker, picking it up with a mic, a mic again, is, is a kind of form of re-encoding, a really terrible form of re-encoding. And it's obviously better just to play it directly. Okay. So um, we've got, so we've, we've finished the form of the presentation bits, haven't we? And we've another, we've 25 minutes and we're going to stay and answer as many questions as we can possibly get through. So some of them, you know, please just keep on with the question, questions coming in. But I'm just going to go back to something that came in a bit earlier on. And um, it was, the, there was questions about, would you have, I guess it's a lockdown question. What, and you talked about bubble Helen, but between you, any tips or ideas for people who are working remotely, you know, trying to put something together with uh, contributors in different locations, what, what might be tips or advice that you'd give to people? So from an editorial point of view, I'll talk about it and probably Magnus is better on the technical front, but editorially, I think it will be to decide early as on as possible about the overall aim, you know, what is this story going to be? Who, who's it for? Who's going to own it? So that, you know, you kind of, although it, we're in lockdown, we still want to think about rights and ownership and, and where it's going to be used and utilised. Also about things like, um, you know, who, it, who the content is suitable for. Uh, but, but clearly, in terms of collaborations, there's been some great ones already. If you're talking about creating a completely new work I suppose then it's just about really ensuring that everybody agrees on the, the the whole process so I think it's good to have a beginning a middle and end kind of think about pre-production production post-production post have an arc of where the, where you're planning and then kind of keep revisiting it checking that everybody's on board uh, that there's clear roles uh, because you know just like it's not just lockdown is it it's it's, it's always the same thing really is who's going to do what by when um and also you know who's going to do the the creation but who's going to start to think about engaging an audience and get them ready for expecting your work I, although i have to say i think it's a really exciting time and you know i cannot wait to see a production where i'm invited to join a chat room in Zoom as a part of a, an audience. I kind of think it's a really exciting time to, to, to try things. Yeah. Although I think we all have to be mindful of the fact we're being bombarded by everyone saying, look at me, look at me. Thank you. Thank you. Magnus, from a technical point of view, is there anything you'd add to what Helen's well, saying? I think um, the, the only thing that really jumps out with, li with live online collaboration is, is the kind of delay factor it's like platforms have i don't know how the musicians are managing to do it there must be a way of you know um affecting the latency on on some of these streams but you know um ha getting rid of delay and lag so that people can really interact you know fluid fluidly is, is always a challenge um going back to what helen was saying i mean we've kind of got the luxury of time now unless you've got kids and then you don't um, so just pre pre planning uh, as much as you can. You know, the the more planning you do, the more you work through it, figure it out, rehearsal, the better it's going to be. Um, and if it, this is a kind of new a new thing, isn't it? A new world. So I would just say just to work uh, work on it in advance as much as you can. Figure out, practice, watch it back. Um, but it is exciting. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of you know obvious kind of oh that it's not going to work because of this, like the technology is incredible now. There's, there's always a way uh, of, of doing what you want. I mean, I, th I think what's interesting is this, this session we're running now, we rehearse this in advance, uh, not, not kind of to word for word, but just to check that all the team members knew what was happening. There's a technical team working so that they can, if things go wrong, what happens? And also Zoom can record you so that, you know, if you want to have a safety copy, on your laptop should something go down then of course you've got a film where if I suddenly keel over and it's not my laptop it's me then Linda presumably will press a button and up pops me from two days ago uh, so you know there are options to plan around yourself okay lovely thank you um, I'm going to go back a bit to a, a question of finance and money really uh, and, and 
scale. Um, and so, somebody's saying we're trying to um, cost crew times from the back to rate card. So this is about costing uh, t technical for, for people who aren't aware of it. So back to being the, the broadcasting union. So it's about technicians and, and crew. So, and they have an, a, a, a standard rate card. We're trying to cost crew times from the back to rate cards, which are set up for TV film commercial. Um, and so then saying that Magnus's point about what the, uh, what we the, in the space we call low cost of five fifteen k is much more money than in this person's budget. Any clues what your fees schedule is based on? I mean, I could. I could this suggestion, this. right? Yeah. Okay. Who, sorry. Sir. So th th you might read the question. It, it's at twelve eighteen, Magnus. Can you see it? I'll find it. Yeah. I mean, this it's quite a. a big thing this because like the world the world's changing and i work in the film industry and i you know uh, work i make make films for tv sometimes um and in the old days uh, the back two rates were sacrosanct and uh, everybody stuck to them the, the trouble with um union rates is it only works if everybody sticks to it so as soon as you have a young camera operator that kind of comes out and says well i don't mind working for a quarter of that rate suddenly they're getting employed instead of somebody who's a super experienced. And then that, that super experienced person says, well, I better lower my rate. Otherwise I'm not going to get work. And the whole thing crumbles a bit. So it's difficult to answer. I mean, I, I, I live in Newcastle here and there are a, a, a bunch of crew that we often work with. And I normally take the view that, um, people usually know the rate that they want. They usually have a rate that they generally offer. And that may be the back to rate, or it may not be. Um, and I also have a budget. And I, I may even ring somebody and say, look, I've got this project. This is how much money I have. And all the camera ops are being paid the same. And I will be totally honest. I'm not, you know, going to pay you less because I think you'll, you'll take less. That's all I can afford. And and leave it up to, to them to, to take it or leave it. But there, there will be somebody listening that says, you know what, you shouldn't be doing that because, you know, the rate, the union rate is the union rate. Having said that, you know, you're probably not working for broadcast, you know, and if you're doing a, a, a drama for, for BBC, the rates are way more critical than they are for, um, you know, a live stream. But it's, a, yeah, a, a big issue. But I don't know, Helen, what do you think? Do you agree? Well, I think it's Matthew Townsend question. I think it's a really good question, um, not just about crews, but about uh, costings totally. I'm slightly confused about whether Matthew's saying the 5 to 15 is more than it's in our budget. I would say that it's, that's a very accurate level that Magnus has described for a low-cost capture. However, two things I'd say is, if you actually don't have any budget at all, then um, often... Uh, student you you know media courses are often really really keen to get their students to do uh, practice runs for theatre companies so I would say you know get a partnership with a, your local university if you have no budget whatsoever if you are talking about um, crews I do think there's absolutely a different rate filming for tv and filming for a low-cost capture for a theatre so rates usually and it's actually you'll find Matthew that it's not just um rates for uh, the crew that you've got to consider. It's also rates for cast. And it's something that the space has really tried to help uh, solve is uh, the, the actual rights that you need. And I think more and more we're moving towards a kind of, it's a slight, it's a kind of philosophical argument really is, I mentioned before about brand equity. I think it's about getting people not not crew here but getting cast for example when you're trying to clear them really trying to get them and their agents to see the benefit of online but it's not financially um it's not going to earn you anything financially but it will earn you a reputation and certainly lots of uh, companies that i've worked with over the years rather than paying huge fees to cast to clear rights what they've done is said we'll give you a copy of the footage and you can use it to promote yourself so i think it's about trying to recognize the value you know people like magnus need to be paid and they obviously the unions are there to protect everyone and it's great however it's about being realistic and pragmatic okay lovely thank you um and 
and I think what's happening here is we've had more questions about rights prompted but as I said we've got a, we've got a, we will have a separate seminar coming up fairly soon where we'll be, go, be able to go into that and give much more advice in much more detail I think we just haven't got the time here and um, one of the other questions which again it it relates to um, finance and business models and so on is about um, do you have any um, advice or suggestions on how you kind of monetize your content whether that might be about um, gathering donations for example any thoughts on how, what, what works what doesn't what you've seen out there well in terms of budgets obviously the space have regular commissioning rounds that mm -hmm. provide funding um, if you're an arts council funded organization and a high level MPO then producing digital content will be part of your MPO funding. If you're not part of an MPO, then the Arts Council clearly has money that you can apply for to create your productions. That's a kind of on a grant level. In terms of getting donations from people, I mean, I think it's now is a really interesting time to see because I would have said people don't. Um, you can use platforms like Patreon and ask people to make donations. Interestingly, during lockdown, I have seen organisations, big and small, asking for donations or a pay what you want. Things like Zoom actually have plugins, so you can use Zoom and charge at the same time. Um, I guess it's, it's a really complicated one, and I actually think we need to learn this at the moment, because up until now, I would say no, use it as a way of building your brand. But clearly, the times are changing. So... I think it's really interesting to possibly try one out and see how your audience reacts. Although you, of course, have to think, what, what am I really offering here over and above what they can see for free? And that's a real challenge for all of us in the sector at the moment, I think. And again, I suppose it, the question is thrown out to, to all, every participant today. Has anybody got any examples of what they've tried that's been successful <laughs> or thought about or experimented with? That would be really helpful. Yeah, we, we run a workshop once before and it was actually an, um, uh, an attendee who talked about how Patreon worked for him as an individual artist. And I think it's probably, from what I understand, more easy for individual artists to get funding in this way than possibly in the past it has been for organisations. Mm, yeah. OK, lovely. Thank you. I've just been dist distracted rather by a question to, to Magnus, which says, what camera are you using and what have you done with the lighting? <laughs> ah, okay. Well, I, I happen to be on, in lockdown with all my kit. So I've actually got my, my kind of £20,000 film camera here um, plugged into my computer, partly because I, I, I'm using a Mac Pro that doesn't have a webcam and partly because I, I wanted to. And so I've got that so I can, you know, get it exactly as I want it. And then I've got a lapel mic. Um, lighting, I, I'm a big believer in natural light if you've got the right room. So actually I don't have any artificial lights, but I, but I have placed myself loosely to try and get this. There's a skylight above me, a bit bright right now actually, and, uh, and some lights behind. Backlight is great, but like Helen says, not, not direct, otherwise you end up silhouetting. But if, it's, um, but if you can get backlight 45 degrees, like Helen said, brilliant advice you get a nice kind of uh, halo-y type of angel-like effect. Um, and, I've, and I've fairly uh, consciously chosen a space in my house which isn't, isn't messy, hopefully, and uh, looks all right. And because I'm using this camera, I can set my iris quite high and put the background out of focus. I'm not sure if you can see that on there. It looks, looks like that on my view. Um, but that helps to see me, you know, in the background is, is uh, separated. So you have the 20 grand view and the 20 pound light, really. Yeah, and, and going back to my, advanced, law of, my law of diminishing returns, I mean, the, the difference probably isn't that great. And you certainly, you can hear and, you know, see Helen absolutely fine. So you can decide. Um, another question that we had earlier was about, um, somebody wanting to uh, live stream from their shed and saying that the Wi-Fi isn't great. And what do you have any tips or advice? And again, I think this is one of those things. Could, there's a very expensive end and a, a cheaper. Which is run, run a cable. And, unless you live in a massive estate, yeah, just run a cable. Um, 
and th- unless you you can't for some reason that's what that's what i would do even if you have to dig a little trench you, you it'll always be great to have a little um socket in your shed or, or even you could put a little uh, router in your shed you you can get wireless extenders um if you've got power in your shed which presumably you do you could that would be a, i guess a simpler thing but the best thing when you're streaming is always to plug in with an ethernet a cable you know everybody's internet at home you may not have looked at it but if if you look at the back of the router there will be probably four uh cat five little sockets there so you can get yourself ethernet cable plug that in plug it into your laptop if you've got a modern laptop they never seem to include them anymore so you'll need a an adapter if you've got a mac you'll need a thunderbolt to ethernet helen's probably got one there to show us now well, and um and then you you can then then the internet won't go down you know uh, nearly as much as it will with wi-fi okay yeah i mean i have got one that i bought actually last week for this specifically because this laptop was on wi-fi and then i realized actually for zoom it's not so great so it's at the back of my computer so i won't actually pull it out but um i think it cost two quid and got sent to me at home during lockdown you know it's about that long you can get them at different lengths you can get so you can get them to your garden shed sounds great anyway who wouldn't want to watch a live stream from a garden shed absolutely i know um another quite a practical question here which is saying we do artists talks and we have not streamed yet but how could we capture audience questions they are Ah, often quite quiet and not caught on the artist's mic this was in my um, my talk actually, and I I missed it off because I was rushing rushing so much. I I did want to make the point before because it's such an important part of the live stream is that audience interaction. Um, a direct so somebody's watching, they write a question, and in the room somebody says, "Oh, we've had this question for this person. It's brilliant for the person watching, and it's gr- it's just great all round." Um, my big advice there is to plan it, have an absolute concrete workflow. How you're going to do that? And, re- and rehearse it who's going to be reading like you have here there's a number of people behind the scenes here reading the questions deciding vetting which one's going to be passed to the presenter or the artist how are you going to pass it do they have an ipad are you going to update a google docs live are you going to pass them a piece of paper are they literally going to be reading the facebook chat not a great idea so you know, make sure you've figured out how you transfer that information, the questions. And then uh, what, 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 uh, there was another part of the question, wasn't there? Forgotten, Linda, what was, what did you say? Well, you're um, trying to remember what you're saying. I'll just say that um, on Dance Consortium, I think you'll have seen the image where Hakim held the tablet. Yeah. So the, all the questions came, Hakim read them out live to the dancers so that people at home could really feel involved. I think the other question was, how do you get your live audience? And I presume that means live in the room audience on mic. And I think yes. Agnes was going to talk about a boom mic. Is that true? Um, <laughs> well, how- my favorite way of doing it with a, the with a room audience is to have a, a, a person with a roving mic. So I don't have it with me and I've got a whole pilot kit here. But I didn't bring that. So it's a, it's a microphone and it has a little transmitter on the back of it. And it's pretty complex text. So you may not be able to to do this on a smaller scale but but it's great because that person's just standing there ready somebody puts the hand up you run over to them you hand them the mic and uh, they talk into it and it's a kind of mic which will only pick up you know what's near them and so it's great for like cutting out all of the the background noise a boom does work um so you basically have a I, I, rather than that person you have a sound recorder standing there with a boom and a mic and that's what they do on question time it's it's better in terms of sound quality, but uh, more expensive. And and these days, I think it, it's some sometimes quicker actually. Um, if if somebody's holding the mic, they can pass it to the next person. And and I'm always there, ready to mute it so that uh, you don't get the rustle of the movement. Okay. Can I really quick? We've only got we've got five minutes left, Helen. So speedy, speedy, if you want to. Okay. So what I was going was picking up on that point, and also something somebody said earlier. If you are doing an artist talk or any other talk. It's important to even think things through like at the beginning of the show, do you want people to clap? So as Magnus said, it's kind of choreographing it. So you might yeah. not want to pay your paid audience to do it, or you might just say invite an audience so that they're almost your, your cast as it were. Um, and the other thing, when we're talking about live audience, I think 
during this conversation, it's do you mean live in the room or do you mean live? And that's actually something to really try and nail with your presenter. Because I often say to the presenter, who are you talking to? And he says, the audience. And I say, yes, but you've got two audiences. You've got the audience in the room with you and you've got the audience at home. And you really need to think about both eye line and also your language so that when you're saying, it's lovely to have you here tonight. If I'm watching from Newcastle, um, I need you to feel, I need to feel involved, I think. It's just kind of a bit like tapping your head and running, rubbing your stomach. It's kind of thinking about them in, in, together. Okay, okay. So we've just got um, a couple of minutes left. And I suppose the, the sort of thing to finish off with would be sort of saying, what's your, what would your key piece of advice be to our audience? You know, what's the one thing that you think is really, really makes the difference when you're thinking about uh, live streaming or capturing an event. Helen, go first? Yeah, um, go. I would say don't don't put the technology before the story. Always put the story first. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Magnus. That's great advice. I I would say um, I've forgotten. I had a great point to make, and I've just forgotten it. Give me a <laughs> give me one second, okay. more. Okay. Then can I ask you a really quickly a very practical question, which was clarification. The, when we're talking about running a cable, the person says, do you mean run an Ethernet cable to the shed and can you use a cable with an iPhone? Yes, um, uh, you, okay. you can plug a phone, uh, uh, you can. But if you have a laptop, I'd probably do that. But the other thing is that you, you have a little like access point. So you have a little wireless router in your shed. So then you've got like good wireless in your shed if you don't want to plug cables into your phone. Okay. Um, okay. I, I can again vouch for that because I bought one off Amazon for 60 quid earlier this week because the Wi-Fi throughout the house was driving me mad. So you just get a little box that adapts to your router and you can take it anywhere. Yeah, I remembered my, my advice point. It was yeah. um, that be prepared to let go of everything and, and, and you know, have an open mind. Um, so if you, if you do something usually a particular way, just say, just step back from that, start from fresh and go, how is this going to work best online and be prepared to make changes and don't be, don't be like attached if possible to the, the way you normally do things. Okay. So I can see Helen nodding that Magnus's point. So I think that's probably a good place to finish.